Welcome to God of Earth. This is Will Sanchez. My very special guest tonight is Kevin Shelton Smith of the Van Cortland Track Club. I first met Kevin on the Putnam Nature Trail. But uh, 10 foot of asphalt for bikes, 3 foot for runners. Runners have got to pass each other when they're going the opposite direction, and they're just going to pull out in front of a, a cyclist, and, it, and it's going to be nasty. It's not safe. Wow. I'm glad this guy's on our team. But I had no idea who he was until much later. I am thrilled to introduce you to Kevin on the Gotta Run Show. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you very much. Kevin, let's get started, as I do with all my shows. Introduce yourself by telling us where you were born and something about your childhood. Uh, I was born in Yorkshire, in England. And uh, my father was in the Royal Air Force at that time, so we moved around. After a few months, we moved out to Aden in Yemen. Um, I was too young to have any memories of that. Came back when I was two. And uh, we moved to the Birmingham area in England for my education. And I stayed there until I was 16, at which point I joined the Air Force too. Is 16 a typical age, or uh, did you get special permission to join? Uh, I joined as an apprentice. And it's vocational training, so my education continued for another three years. And uh, I wanted to be a pilot, but I was too young to be a pilot at 16. Um, so I had to do something else. I really didn't want to go to college. <laughs> Interesting. You just learn about uh, airplanes? Yeah, I was uh, an airframes and engines technician. So after three years of training, which included some qualifications along the way, of course, uh, I then entered service uh, maintaining Harrier jump jets. Well, I became a pilot, and, um, and subsequent to that, they were looking for engineers. Um, and I had the right background, and they were giving uh, degrees if you were prepared to spend three years studying for them. So I switched again and returned to engineering, having got flying out of my blood. So that was a great experience for you. It, was, it was. In terms of education and, and the, all the things you must have seen. Yes. <laughs> I left, and... Uh, and in the nature of things, you, you look for another job, and I, I found a job with the United Nations mm. here in New York in uh, a, the aviation department of peacekeeping. Interesting. And what does that entail? Well, we have about 15 peacekeeping missions around the world. Mm. Um, typically, you, you tend to find on the news, you hear about the ones where your own forces are, mm -hmm. and, and what you typically hear of is Kosovo and Iraq and Afghanistan, of course. Um, which are UN-sanctioned missions, but not the 15 that we typically think of. We're in uh, the Congo, Ivory Coast, Sudan, including Darfur, uh, Sierra Leone. All of these peacekeeping missions require aircraft, um, sometimes for moving troops around, sometimes uh, there are attack helicopters for p defensive purposes or uh, uh, persuasive purposes. And uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of logistic support that's needed Troops got in. Uh, troops have to get in. Troops have to get out. Uh -huh. um, food has to arrive. Their supplies have to come and go, uh, and, and so on. So we have uh, over 200 aircraft uh, in these peacekeeping missions, and my job is, in, entails planning new missions, working out how many aircraft we would need, what they would do, um, how many people we would need for those aircraft and whether the airfields need any improvements or equipment, and then getting it all. I get the aircraft, which could be from government sources around the world. Uh, they may be chartered in, but they would come with their own pilots and maintenance and all this sort of thing. And uh, so we build up our air fleet as, as we need it, and, uh, and then I have to pay for it. Oh, my goodness. And make sure it's okay. Your family really must be really proud of this work. They are, they are, and uh, it's, it's hard to believe that I ever ended up in a diplomatic service. It's nice. <laughs> it sounds sometimes a little dangerous because of the, of the, of the area you're in, mm -hmm. concerns mm -hmm. about your safety. Well, I've never heard my family express any concern. Um, so, but uh, having said that, I don't necessarily tell them everything I do. I see, I see. So you may have had a, a one or two moments where, hmm... <laughs> There's been a few. <laughs> I think I'll keep that to my, uh, my diary or my yeah, book. Yeah, um, we've had a, a few close calls. Um, okay. Times when we've gone into places that uh, we only just got out of. Uh -huh. And then we went back again the next day, which seemed a strange thing to do. But um, Not of your own volition or uh, go back the next day. She said, go back. 
um, well, we, we were doing a job and we just went back and got on with it. Interesting. Well, listen, I want to thank you for your service. I mean, this is something you don't hear much about. Oh, I, I certainly never heard about this beekeeping service that you're part of. Thank you. But now you're into running big time. Mm. So how did that running start? Because the bases had, had teams and uh, midweek we'd, mm -hmm. we'd compete against each other over plowed fields or through woods or whatever it might be. And uh, so I've always kept that, that going in one form or another. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was doing my degree, it was on an army uh, college and they were into orienteering. You'd have a map and a compass and you'd just be going as fast as you could and it might just be 10 kilometers or something. Interesting. Yeah. You'd probably make a good candidate for the amazing race. <laughs> <laughs> if only I had the time. Well, what was your first officially sanctioned race? There was one road race in particular that we did uh, called the Henlow 10, 10 miles. And uh, I did that when I was 17. And I was seven seconds over the hour. And apparently I was the first person to not break the hour. That really had to be sorted out. And year after year I would try again and I wouldn't quite, I wouldn't quite do it. And um, even when I was really fit, something would happen and it wouldn't quite work out. Okay. But, um, uh, and then suddenly at the age of 30, um, I, I did the race again. I'd, I'd been away training for some, some long distance events in Cyprus. Mm. And uh, that must have put some strength into the legs. And I came back and got 15 seconds under the hour. And I thought, at last. And so that was it. After that, I, I didn't run another 10 mile race for years and years and years. I thought, Interesting. done it. So you retired shortly. Retired. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the age of 30, breaking the one hour. I mean, that's, a, that's under six minute miles. Yeah. And and something I, happened that, that brought you back. And when I came to New York, I found that uh, road running here in the city was uh, a much bigger sport than anything else mm -hmm. uh, running related. So it, it followed on that I would start doing the local races here, predominantly in Central Park. Um, but of course, the there hasn't been much in the way of 10 mile races here. Mm -hmm. So that, th that record was standing for a very long time um, and, until just a couple of years ago when uh, I had the opportunity to do another 10 miler. And you <coughs> did better than 10 seconds under. When I turned 50, um, I broke the hour again and, and broke the time I'd run when I was 30. And I just couldn't fathom out That's how that was possible. Interesting. But at some point, during this time, you joined a Van Cortlandt track club. Is there a yep. story behind that? Yeah, well, I was 47 and, and I was doing the odd, the odd run here. And uh, one of the um, ladies in our, our club, Kate, um, that I also work with, she's in uh, UNICEF. Um, she mentioned that I might like to run with the club uh, because I, I really didn't uh, know a lot of people in the city. My family had gone back to the UK when my daughters became teenagers. Do you have an interesting story how you met your wife? Oh, that is an interesting story, actually. Um, I used to do a lot of car maintenance. I still do, but now it's on my daughter's cars. <laughs> um, I'd, 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 <laughs> try not to make it too long a story, but I'd had a car which um, I'd been building up and I'd, I'd replaced the roof on it. And in doing so, I'd, I'd been working with some cutting tools and I'd got some metal in my eyes. Ooh. So uh, I reported to the, um, the Air Force Medical Center um, and they patched me up the best they could and, and decided that more was needed. So they sent me to the RAF hospital and uh, it was just regular transport. Mm -hmm. And my wife was in the, uh, well, my future wife was in the, the transport visiting her brother-in-law. So uh, with my eyes bandaged up, uh, we got talking and uh, I made it uh, um, my business to make sure we're on the same transport going back and uh, talk to us some more. Of course, I maintained the point that I was half blind at the time, but, but <laughs> it was a lucky decision all, all around him, as it turned out. And um, before you knew it, there we were. So for you, it was love at first sight, even though you had a half a sight. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Great, and you won her over. But that time, you weren't, you weren't a runner that you are today. Not, not like I am now. You oh. know, in those days, I, I, would, I would run races, but I, I didn't really have a lot of interest in training. I, had to, I was working on my car, I had other things to do. Okay. Life was far too, too full and, and of course a lot of the guys would want me to go running lunch times. Um, and in the Air Force you've paid for your three meals a day whether you have them or not. And I wasn't going to miss lunch just to go running. <laughs> 
I see. Food was more important. Absolutely. Than okay. Well, let's go back to the Van Cortland Track Club. So you uh. joined them, it looks like, when you were our friend, invited you. I turned up, ran with the guys, found that they were a, a tremendously friendly crowd. And, well, how big uh, was they at that time when you joined? I think there were 57 people in the club at the time. Okay. Um, and, and half of them would turn up and, and, and run, and uh, a few of them, a few of us would stay behind for, for brunch. Okay. Uh, oh, yes, at yes. the short stop cafe afterwards. Oh yes, yes. Um, in the in the Bronx, yes. In the Bronx, and uh, I got more and more involved, and, and started encouraging people to to run races, and said, you know, guys, if we actually all turned up, we'd have a team, and we started doing reasonably well in the uh, the older age groups, and, and at that time the the ladies over fifties team. Uh, were scoring, they were doing very well, okay. but nobody else. Yeah, you know, I think you have over 400 members at this point. Yeah, and, and if you look at the, uh, the, the cross-section of age groups, it's, it runs right through from the, from the 20s, right through to the 70s and beyond. We've just had to open up an, an over-80s uh, club records category now. For, over uh, 80? <laughs> oh, but what, what made the difference? What, uh, what attracted all these people to the Van Court? Well, it, it's hard to say. I um, coerced a few people to, to join and... Uh, that esprit de corps that the club has, mm -hmm. harnessing that and getting everyone to go to events, we started getting more and more noticed. Um, you know, perhaps also there's been a demographic change in the Bronx, more younger people are moving out there. Okay. But it's not just younger people. I mean, the club has simply grown. New York Marathon, we had over 70 people in the marathon. That's more people you used to have in the club. <laughs> this weekend, we've got a 5K, over 100 people are running. I've seen pictures of you run, and you really are an intense, you really run as hard as you can at those 5Ks. I yeah. Mean, from yeah. based on those photos. I, I give it everything I've got, and sometimes you turn up at the beginning of a race and you think, oh, why am I here again? And what I, uh, but once that gun goes, you, you, you go and, and you just get back into the groove and, and I, you just give it absolutely everything you can. Something happened in, I think in 2012, you were nominated or elected or you won the uh, Ultra Run of the Year for the club. Well, in 2011, um, I'd run the Spartathlon. Oh, my goodness. And the Spartathlon is a, is a race of 153 miles, uh, non-stop, uh, between Athens in Greece and Sparta. It's 490 BC, late September. Darius, king of the Persian Empire, disembarks 40,000 soldiers on the beach of Scania in Attica. Its aim, the capture and destruction of Athens. The Athenians are preparing for the upcoming conflict and are searching for allies. They decide to ask for help from the Spartans and they send a foot messenger for Dipodes to Sparta. Herodotus, who chronicled the events of the era, mentions that Pheidippides arrived in Sparta the next day. Herodotus describes the unprecedented feat like this. Can a man make it through an impassable 246 kilometer mountain path within two days. Pheidippides knew how critical his mission was. It was a battle with time. The Athenians needed help immediately. But with the Spartathlon, they're moving up the sweep behind you all the time. If you fall behind, you're put on the bus. So you had to make the cutoff points. And it was, all it was several... the way, all the way. Well, there's, there's over 70. Over 70 cutoff yeah. points. The, the conditions, it's really quite hot, um, and they want to make sure that uh, there's water on the course available for you, which I'm sure Pheidippides didn't have. He didn't have a crew, I don't Didn't think. have a crew. <laughs> it's kind of a crew. That's probably why he died <laughs> near, near the end there. Yeah. But the course goes through all these ancient um, cities. You go through Corinth and so on. But, and uh, the focus of my first day, really, was to get to Corinth 50 miles away. In, in the time allowed, uh, uh, starting from the Acropolis in Athens. And um, it was tough going. It's the first 50. 
I arrived with, with no more than two minutes to spare. Sounds like you did it right on. Bang on. And, and by the way, this was your <laughs> first time doing this. First time. And this is a race that over 80% do not finish. Well, not that year, they didn't. Um, it is said that more people have been in space than have finished Spartathlon. This is a very hard race for a <laughs> so-called rookie here. Yeah, and, and there are qualifying standards to get into it. So nobody that were there was an amateur as such. That's right. And, and yet 200 people, the year I did it, out of 350 that started, were uh, removed from the race, timed out okay. at Corinth, 50 miles. Okay. And I really couldn't see myself getting past the 100-mile point, the way things were going. But that wasn't going to stop me trying. And at 60 miles, I had a pair of fresh shoes waiting for me. And I put them on, and it was like having a pair of new feet. It was phenomenal. I couldn't believe the difference. I built up an, an hour's cushion, okay. which I could then use. Uh, I got a massage at one point for 20 minutes, which I thought was a good investment. <laughs> Carried on, quickly built the hour buffer back up again. Uh, mightily concerned about the heat of the, of the next day. I wanted to make sure that I still had that little bit of buffer. Uh -huh. uh, but you're continuously thinking about um, everything you did making sure that this was going to help, that you were protecting yourself, that you weren't going to overdo it or underdo it, and uh, monitoring every ache and pain and, and keeping yourself totally in charge of, of this logistics operation okay. that was going to get you to Sparta. Okay. For most of it, you were running by yourself. Maybe at the yeah. beginning, you ran for a couple of friends. Yeah, yeah. We're going to fucking kill it, man. You feel like shit doesn't matter. A day and a half is nothing. It's going to go by in the blink of an eye. Nothing. If you feel awful, it's going to pass. You're going to feel great. All of us, we make it to Sparta. That moment when you think you're DNFing, you're done, think about how quickly you're going to feel good again. You feel like shit, walk, run, do whatever you get. We are all making to the finish line this year. No bullshit, no excuses. You deliver that message to the king. I'm with Mike Arnstein and, and Oz Perlman, who, um, after about 20 miles, just disappeared into the distance. But that was their second attempt, so they... Uh... Mm. They've got smarter. I mean, they knew what they were doing at this point. Yeah, and, and they both finished. Now, where did you find a training program to do such a thing? Or did you talk to... I just uh, made it up. You made it up yourself? Just made it up. You didn't talk to prior guys and say, hey, what did you do? <laughs> well, well, I, is, everybody I, was custom made. Yeah, pretty much custom made. Uh, I, I guess um, over the years I've, I've picked up things from other people. I, I've done um, a few ultras before. Um, I've probably done more, more ultras in a way than, than marathons. Uh, and I've done 44 marathons now. Uh, so I've, I've learned what works. I know what you need to do. You've got to build it up gradually, which is a far cry from my first marathon experience where I had no idea what I was supposed to do, but I thought I knew. The mental capacity must have been tremendous. I mean, a lot of marathoners, they say, you know, they hit the wall at mile 20. Yeah. Here, <laughs> I don't know what you're hitting that tells you your yeah. mental capacity well, must have been telling you. I've done 100 mile races, and to think, if someone to say, can you go and do another 50? No. But if you prepare for 150, 100 miles, is, is, it's just a, um, a milestone along the way. Uh -huh. And uh, you focus on that. The first 100 mile I did, I, I got to the 25 mile point, And I thought, well, that's great. It's like a whole marathon done almost. Um, and I thought, yeah, it's also 9 o'clock in the morning. And you're still going to be doing this come midnight tonight. So just bear that in mind. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and you, f you take that, you know, you... you you take that and, uh, uh, and, and you tune yourself to it. It's not almost done. And you pace yourself accordingly. Uh, you're not going at marathon pace. Um, and you've got to prepare, be prepared for the, for the long day. And you've got to train in the summer months and uh, get the body used to, to the heat. The heat. And also, you say it was very cold at night or got cold. It was there, yeah. It was blowing a gale on top of the mountain. Um, but in my training, I'd done uh, you know, long runs one day followed by another long run the next day. And then maybe I'd take a t couple of days off. Uh -huh. you know? uh -huh. So it's, I would work it in with um, family trips and, and try not to annoy the family too much. But I think over the years, the family has just become so accustomed to the running I do. Uh -huh. I don't think they've ever um, celebrated me as, a, as, as an athlete in any way. In fact, My family, I, primarily your wife and daughters? Yeah, my, my parents are immensely proud and, uh, and say so. I think my wife often, um, yeah, bless her for it, but I think she felt that I um, gave running more, more attention than I gave her. 
Um, but of course, she's in England at the moment, and okay. um, so I can give it a lot of training, but I still think it rubs the wrong way a little bit back okay. home. So you've got to work extra hard to make that up. Got to work that. extra hard on that one, and um, and of course, every, any day that you don't do a run, you yourself feel that you've made a tremendous sacrifice, but right. it goes unnoticed <laughs> by right. anybody else. That's right. How did you finish that race? There's all this energy at the, at the finish, and I just threw myself up these stairs, charged up, and then leapt up um, to jump onto the top as I arrived. Wow. The tradition is to kiss the, the tradition feet. is to kiss the toe. And, and ostensibly, you're bringing the message from Athens. Um, so this is the greeting that we've done. And then, the, then the, uh, the maidens have brought water from the, the, uh, the river, uh -huh. uh, which is sanctified. And, um, and, wow. and they give you a drink from the bowl. At that head. moment when you were drinking, and that, how did you feel? They, they treat every single finisher as if they're the winner. And, um, and you, you honestly feel as though you are. It's the most fulfilling thing you can think of. Were, so happy. Were you at the top of the world at that oh, point? You, you couldn't have upset me that day. <laughs> Sat there with the biggest smile on my face you could possibly ma imagine. But yeah, it was just tremendous. And uh, of course, all, all the other runners, you, you meet up with them, and uh, um, including the vast majority that didn't finish. Right, and, right. and they're incredibly supportive, yes. and they want to know what, what did you do that perhaps they could yep, learn yep, from, yep, and, yep, and yep. so on. Um, some aren't so pleased, but they're all pleased for those that have finished. Um, you suddenly have this, this tremendously close family, and they, they meet in little groups, and, and you, you could sit with any group and be at home. And it... It didn't matter what nationality they were from. They were from all over. Um, I was just absorbed into the GB team. I was part of the American team. And, you know, given the, 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 the ratios of people that finish, <clears throat> there were four people from New York that ran that year. And all four finished. Interesting. Quite remarkable. Uh, Oz, Quite remarkable. Mike, yourself, and it was a fourth? Um, was that Chisholm? Yeah. Chisholm. So was three but, from yeah, the Man Quartland yeah, Track Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You probably got the... Record for that, most uh, <laughs> finishers. If anyone was counting, I would think so. I would think so. Some small number of women uh, even yeah. finish. Yeah, in fact, the, the third person overall was an English girl from, uh, from, uh, from, from the UK. Um, uh, but you know, that, at that stage, you're talking about people who are near professional mm -hmm. and are sponsored and all sorts of things. There's no prize money. No prize money. No prize money. Well, no, a belt buckle. You get a, a, an olive wreath for you. Oh, wait a minute. You can, uh, you I think your, I have a shirt trophies. here. You get a nice shirt. Oh, well, that was, that was from the, the GB team. And, um, in fact, you can see on it the, the, the roots. Was this the shirt you wore or you wore something else? Um, I have a, a shirt that I've had since the 2006 London Marathon. Uh -huh. Um, you had to finish your shirt? Yeah. So this is the shirt you wore? Yeah, that's getting well worn now. Um, it's not as white as it used to be. This is the, the London Marathon shirt. I, I, like, I like the way they, they subdue themselves. They don't you know, um, splay London Marathon all, all over it with a uh, huge amount of advertising. But very small text that says, impossible is nothing. And I feel that if I'm wearing that shirt, you've got to finish. It's, a, it's another part of the mind game that gets you through. All the way through. All the way. Oh, yeah. excellent. Yeah. Yeah. excellent. Yeah. For all these trophies and plaques, do you have a favourite one here that we can discuss? Um, well, I'm, I'm particularly honoured by this one. This is last year's Boston Marathon mm -hmm. uh, medal, which for obvious reasons I shall always hold close to my heart. We were right at the finish line, having picked up our things, meeting our friends when, when the bombs oh. went off. Um, so we were... We were um, a little bit too close for comfort okay. on that occasion. So okay. I will always remember that. And I should be entering this. again this year in memory of all those that can't. Yeah, Boston Strong, yes. Yeah. And, and, and this is my uh, shirt from last year as well, of oh, course. Excellent. This is my Spartathlon oh, excellent. Uh, medal. But, but, oh, um, that up again. Yeah, sure. People can uh, show that to uh, camera can catch. Oh, and it, and it has and a, I like the, runner the is, Greek uh, runner. Naked. And, uh, but, I, but you're not allowed no, to run wearing, this race naked, right? Uh, and I had shorts. <laughs> <laughs> in this case, Union Jack shorts. And uh, again, that's something I wear in the New York Marathon, which I've run uh, 13 times now. 
um, to put pressure on myself because you can't be seen to be letting the side down. Oh, you can't let the empire no. down. <laughs> and, any last favorite ones here? Um, this one is, is the, uh, the, the 10 mile race where at the age of 50, I broke that. Oh, that's that, very that, special. That, uh, I've never seen a shoe, you know. It's a, it's a marvelous uh, idea. Uh, uh, trophy, I do like okay. it. And, and I have one here from the New York Roadrunners, which is um, probably a little bit difficult to see. But again, last year, I broke the 10 mile time again. And I still don't know how, I'm, <laughs> how it's possible. It shouldn't be possible. But, um, but this trophy here is the, the, the showing the, the tortoise and the hare. This typifies Van Cortlandt Track Club so much. And it's, it's taken from the statue in Van Cortlandt Park. It indicates what our club is all about. We have slow people, we have fast people. We have old people, we have young people. Uh, we have people that race, we have people that don't race. But everybody's welcome and everybody comes. And everybody, if they're not running, they're cheering. And, and this is one of the great things. You, we have a table that we set up for the New York Marathon in the Bronx mm -hmm. and uh, at, at uh, mile 21 in a race. And we're cheering for the Bronx and, and all our runners coming through. But we have candy and stuff, and usually leftovers from Halloween. Okay. And we give it to any runner that wants it. Okay. <laughs> but this particular trophy is, is, is um, all the more poignant to me because um, it was given to me uh, by Mike Arnstein, who thought that I was, in his view, the runner of the year. Oh, for which year? Um, in, in 2012. Okay. Uh, and the same year, New York Roadrunners honoured me with the same award. Oh, excellent. Uh, for my age group. For, for your age group, the runner of the year. Well, listen, on that note, congratulations on all these honours. And I'm sure there will probably be a few more personal bests on your way. <laughs> well, I, I, I keep thinking I've plateaued, but we'll see. we'll see. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Will. Thank you.